Thank you, choir. Mark has me a new microphone today. So I've got it around both ears and on my mouth here. So if I'm loud, they'll turn me down. If I'm soft, they'll turn me up. Uh, uh, my first time. So if I bump it a lot, please excuse me. Look with me in your Bibles to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. The bread of life. Several years ago, a church member mentioned to Melinda that she made bread. Well, the conversation progressed, and before long, Melinda had some starter bread. Have you ever, ladies, ever had some starter bread? Now, I have to admit, the bread was wonderful. After a few weeks, Melinda was making some perfect bread. I mean, I loved it. It was all good. Then she tried making different kinds of bread. We experimented with this bread and that bread. Before long, she just kept making bread because if she didn't keep making the bread, you know, you lost the starter. It just kind of grows and it grows and it grows. When I was studying this passage of Scripture, Jesus calls himself the bread of life. I thought that is how he wants to be. He wants to just keep growing and growing and growing in our lives. Isn't that a cool thought? That he didn't just save you and stop. There's a whole lot that he wants to do after that. It just keeps growing and growing. He is an ever-growing source of physical and spiritual sustenance for us. So notice with me, if you would, three things about this bread of life that Jesus calls himself today. First, the people were searching. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the opposite shore of the lake realized that only one boat had been there and that Jesus had not entered it with his disciples, but that they had gone away alone. Then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten bread after the Lord had given thanks. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. Now, the Bible says the next day they came back to the spot where they were fed. That's how I know these folks is Baptist. They found a good covered dish dinner, and they came back the next day. They wanted some more. Now, the Bible doesn't say if it was breakfast time, lunch time, or dinner time, uh, but you know they were looking for Jesus. They saw the disciples leave, and they saw Jesus stay behind, but when they began to look for him, they couldn't find him. So they begin to ask questions and wonder, where is he? What's going on? About that time, these other boats arrived from the other side of the lake, and they realized that they must have crossed the lake, the disciples, and that Jesus may even be with them. So they get in these boats and cross the lake. For whatever reason, the people were still searching for Jesus. People have always gone where Jesus is. Always. Another passage says that the town noticed that Jesus was in the house, you remember that when he healed the guy that down through the roof. And they packed the place out. Now there's a truth in that. People pack the place out when Jesus is in the house. Amen. Always have, always will. You see, when Jesus shows up, the community knows about it. So what does the church have to do to get a crowd? Well, there are many ways to get a crowd. But I would say the best way is to let them know Jesus is is in the house. What a concept to let everybody know that he is alive and well. People will drive for miles to go to a church that is on fire for Jesus. People don't care about inconveniences and travel and heat and seating arrangements when Jesus is in the house. May I say to you that probably less than 100 yards from where you are sitting today, hundreds of cars rode by going to churches that weren't this one. Maybe even some churches where Jesus was in the house and it was on fire. Cool, baby. You know, there are some places where he is just pouring out his spirit. You see, that becomes our job, doesn't it? That's our job. That's our job. Look, let's get this. That's our job. The Bible says, if Jesus is not a liar, that where two or three are gathered, yes, there I am. I'm in the house. So our job is to let this community know that Jesus is in the house. People 2,000 years ago were searching for Jesus. People this morning are searching for Jesus. Our job is to witness. Our job is to love. Our job is to care. It's his job to meet people's needs. But we have responsibility in this. What is your responsibility for you being the only one on your pew? 
You got some responsibility in that. What's my responsibility for the pews not being full? I've got some responsibility in that. I think we can solve some of that Friday night. I've asked you for three months to mark that date off your calendar. I know you can get out at nighttime. I saw you this past week. It was dark. We can. We can do what we want to. So let's want to do what Jesus wants us to do. Let's get out and let's make a difference in people's lives. That's our job to let them know Jesus is in the house. But the people wanted a sign. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, where did you, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I'll tell you the truth. You are looking for me not because of the miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Amen? Well, we can get it out if we have some good food, right? Amen? We can do that. Jesus goes on to say, Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works of God? Jesus answered, The work of God is this. You know, you ought to circle this in your Bible, highlight it, circle it on the outline, something. When they ask Jesus a question like that, he kind of sums it all up. And it's worth memorizing. He says this, to believe in the one he has sent. When the people arrive after walking, some of them after rowing across the sea to find Jesus, they said, how, how, how did you get here? We saw you leave by yourself, and there was only one boat, and they took you. How did you get here? They didn't see him walk on the water, but they knew he must have done something amazing. How'd you get here? But Jesus knows the real motive behind why they're searching for him. He has the ability to know why people are doing what they're doing. See, he can discern your motivation. That in and of itself ought to make you repent. That makes me repent because God knows my motivation. Sometimes you and I are confused about our motivation. But God knows our motivation. This reminds me of the time he talked to Nicodemus. Nicodemus is sitting there asking questions and Jesus just kind of goes through all the different layers and gets to his heart. He says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. What? He just cut through all the layers. You see, he knows these people are just looking for a free meal. Can I tell you there are people in our society today looking for a free meal? Hello? There are people out there like that. Yes, there are. Jesus knew they were looking for a free meal. But I have something to eat, he said, that's better than the fish and the loaves. I literally am the bread of life. Then notice what Jesus says and notice it carefully. Do not work for food that spoils. That's what you ate for breakfast. That's what you're going to have for lunch. That's what you're going to have for dinner. Don't work for that food. But for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, on Him the Father has placed His seal of approval. Then they ask Him, what must we do to do the works of God? Jesus, re Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one He has sent. Now, have you ever tried or accidentally eaten some spoiled food? It's exciting. <laughs> you may have uh, turned that jug of milk up when there was just a little bit left to discover why it was left. <laughs> you, you may have eaten a bite of something in a restaurant and realized, huh, they didn't cook this chicken all the way through. Oh, you, you know, you, you, you've had some stuff like that. So we understand what it means. It might be that the bread and the mayonnaise stayed out too long. Look, we know what it means for food to spoil. There is bacteria in it. It'll make you sick. Jesus said, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life. Don't work for earthly food. He said, your father knows what you need. He knows how many birds there are. He knows if one of them falls to the ground, you're more important to him than the birds. He said, I've got the food thing. I promise I'll feed you. Many in America today are working for money and for a paycheck rather than for the Lord God. Things that used to be right are now wrong. All in the name of a job. Things that used to be wrong are now right. All about making money. You remember Joe Wright, the minister? He was asked to pray at a new session of the Kansas State Senate. They expected him to do just a little God bless the senators. God bless them and help them and keep them. They expected that. That wasn't what they got. <laughs> he spoke the truth. Everyone was expecting one thing and got something else. Here's what he said. Heavenly Father, we come before you today to ask forgiveness and to seek your direction and guidance. 
We know your word says. Woe to those who call evil good. But that is exactly what we have done. We have lost our spiritual equilibrium and reversed our values. We confess that. We have ridiculed the absolute truth of your word. And we call it pluralism. We have exploited the poor. And we call it the lottery. We have rewarded laziness. And we call it welfare. We have killed our unborn and called it choice. We have shot abortionists and called it justifiable. We have neglected the discipline of our children and called it building self-esteem. We have abused power and called it politics. We have coveted our neighbor's possessions and called it ambition. We have polluted our air with profanity and pornography and called it freedom of expression. We have ridiculed the time-honored values of our forefathers and called it enlightenment. Search us, O oh God, and know our hearts Cleanse us from every sin and set us free. Guide and bless these many women who have been sent to direct us to the center of your will and to openly ask these things in the name of your Son, our living Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 The response was immediate. Many legislators stood and walked out during the prayer. In six short weeks, the Central Christian Church, where Reverend Wright is pastor, logged more than 5,000 phone calls, with only 47 of those calling to respond negatively. Now the church is receiving international requests for copies of the prayer from India to Africa to Korea. Amen. What he said was the truth. Whether we like it or not, it's still the truth. Amen. Commentator Paul Harvey <clears throat> repeated the prayer on his show and he said we have received a larger response to this program than any program we've ever aired Paul Harvey says some good shows imagine that with the Lord's help may this prayer and this type of prayer sweep our nation and wholeheartedly bring us back to one nation under God People were looking for a sign in Jesus' day. People are looking for a sign today. He has delivered the sign. He has written it down in His holy word. What sign is it you're waiting for? I got the answer to your sign. It's in the book. It's in black and white, red and white, whatever. It's in the book. He has already answered your prayer. Don't ask Him for a sign. Perhaps you're looking for a free meal ticket. Perhaps you're looking for a happy life. Boy, that sounds so good. But the Bible says, you chase that, you're just chasing the wind. You better chase a joy-filled life, serving Jesus. Don't you work for what this world offers. It spoils. It rots. It will not fill you up and satisfy the long term. Perhaps you're looking for someone who will simply take your problems away. Maybe the next president, the next governor, the next whatever. Jesus promised, he said, I'll take care of what you need. But he said, you need to remember this. Work for food that endures to eternal life. Would you like to eat some bread this morning? Now we're going to have the Lord's Supper in a minute. Would you like to eat some bread that satisfies you forever? It's good bread doesn't spoil. It lasts forever and forever. Would you like to drink some water that wells up in you and becomes a spring of life? Jesus offers that. You want a sign? I give you a sign. I promise Jesus would change you from darkness to light, from a sinner to a saint, from a heathen to a heaven-bound Christian. Old things will pass away. Behold, all things will become new. How's that for a sign? That's the sign. All those things are His promises for us. Well, we've seen the people searching. I've seen the people wanting a sign. Now let's look for the seal of approval. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give. On Him, God the Father has placed His seal of approval. That's a good statement, isn't it? Wouldn't you like to be able to say that God has placed His seal of approval on you? 
I mean, God places his seal of approval on him. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works that God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe on the one he has sent. So they asked him, what miraculous sign then will you give us that we may see and believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate manna in the desert, as it is written, and gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. It is not Moses who has given the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on give us this bread. He talks first of all about the earthly bread. He said, you ate these loaves and you had your fill. You ate the fish and the loaves yesterday. People come to Jesus for many reasons, and, and it doesn't really matter the reason why you come initially. Just come. You know, you may come because you've got some terrible problem, and you need that problem resolved. It may be a physical ailment. That's okay to come to Jesus for that. It may be that somebody preached this fire and health stone sermon, and you realize I don't want to suffer in hell forever, and you come. That's okay. Come on. It may be that everything in your life was good. You just realized there was more to it. You thought about eternal things. Whatever the reason, just simply come. But when he comes to live inside of you, everything changes. It's no longer your motivation. It's no longer your agenda. It becomes what he wants. Today we have plenty to eat, so our concern is on more pressing things. <laughs> well, we want a second car. We want a beach house or a lake house. We want some clothes. We want another fishing pole. Or maybe the latest set of those good big-headed drivers. <laughs> I mean, well, we always want something else. Maybe it's those special running shoes. Maybe it's those walking shoes. Maybe it's those dress shoes. Maybe it's another 20 pairs of shoes. Whatever it is. Jesus declares, if you're looking for me for the wrong reason, earthly things will not satisfy you. Then the people reminded him, well, Moses gave us a sign. He said there was some earthly bread of Moses. They went out every morning and they picked it up. Early in the morning for 40 years, God reminded them of his faithfulness. There was bread and manna there every day. They collected it. Collected enough for one day. You know what happened? They collected enough for two days? It rotted. It rotted. That's right. <laughs> That's what Jesus said. Don't work for food that rots. Don't waste your time doing that. But on Friday, they could collect enough for Friday and Saturday. This earth, the bread of Moses, fell for them year after year. You know why? God is faithful. You will not be able to look at him and say, you weren't faithful to me. You're a liar. He is faithful. He has always been faithful. But Jesus said, Moses didn't feed you. Moses can't make bread come out of the sky. Don't give credit to the wrong person. And he talks about the heavenly bread of the Father. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, it's not Moses who has given you this bread from heaven, but my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Sir, no one give us this bread. Now Jesus tells them that Moses' bread did not satisfy, but the Father's bread would satisfy them. He proved his love and faithfulness every morning by giving them this bread. And then he proved it again by sending them the bread of God. This is he who comes down out of heaven. Jesus said, I'm him. You're looking at the bread of life. You don't have to go anywhere else. I am here. Now go back up to verse 28 with me. Then he asked them. They asked him, what must we do to do the works that God requires? The people are beginning to understand there is more than just fish and loaves. They're beginning to understand that God wants to give them eternal life. So they ask Jesus a question. We want to do the works of God. What are these works? They look at verse 29. He says this. The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. The work of God is to believe in Jesus. Did you get that? If you believe in anything else, you will miss the work of God. Don't get caught up in believing it's about church membership or it's about some other religion. It is not. It has always been about Jesus. To believe Him 
Yes, we believe Him for food. We believe Him for clothing. We believe Him for shelter. But then we believe Him for more. There's eternal stuff that we believe Him for. And this requires faith. It always has. And it always will. It's not about what we can see. But we are very limited. And we limit God. It is about the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So here's the question. What's the purpose for Walter? If we are to reach people for Christ, we need people with passion and power for people. When we say people matter to God, if they don't matter to you, then you're not going to tell anybody about it. If they don't matter to you enough to change the comfort zone that you're in, to get outside of yourself and tell them, you say, well, you talk about the park again. No, I'm talking about Walmart. you ever go to Walmart? If you ever go to Walmart, there are about 10,000 people in the parking lot waiting for you to witness to them. I don't like you to eyeball to eyeball. Then email them. When's the last time you emailed somebody the gospel? When's the last time you Facebooked somebody the gospel? When is the last time you text somebody the gospel? If you're not doing that, then how about looking at them eyeball to eyeball at Walmart? Have them a car. Invite them. Tell them the story of Jesus. In the late 1800s, no business matched the financial and political dominance of the railroads. Trains dominated the transportation industry in the United States, moving both people and goods throughout the country. Then a new discovery came along called the horseless carriage. You may have ridden in one of those this morning. It's incredible. The leaders of the railroad industry did not take advantage of their vast amount of money and position to participate in the revolution. The automobile revolution happened all around them, and they didn't see it. Duh. I'm so glad that can't happen today. <laughs> Rather than using their money in their place, they simply watched it go by. In his video, take, uh, In Search of Excellence, Tom Peters points out the reason. The railroad barons did not understand the business they were in. They thought they were in the train business, but they were in fact in the transportation business. Time passed them by, as did opportunity. They couldn't see what their real purpose was. If the railroad barons at the turn of the century had understood they were in the transportation business, and not in the train business, you wouldn't be driving a Ford or a General Motors. You'd be driving a Google. You'd be driving a C and W. You'd be driving a Southern. The same thing happened when the airplanes came along. They didn't use their money or their power or their influence. Or you'd be flying C and S, not Delta. They could have owned those industries. But they didn't know their purpose. They thought it was all about people coming to them. Because we've been here all these years. We've got the facilities. We own every train track east of the Mississippi. And they lost it. Anybody ridden a train in the last week? But you probably drove a car. Might be the flaw on the plane. They missed it. The Swiss made the same mistake. The Swiss had dominated timekeeping for ever and ever. They controlled 90% of all the revenues made in their industry. Now think about that. One country got 90% of all the revenues made from every clock in the world. That's pretty good income stream. They made the most precise gears and springs in the world. Their watches and clocks were perfect. Then something new happened called the quartz crystal. Guess who invented it? A Swiss man. But because it had no gears, no knobs, no springs, they said, it won't work. They failed to recognize they were in the business of keeping people on time, not in the gear and spring business. They lost their dominance in the industry. Now they control 20% of the revenue, and Seiko is the dominant leader. Wow. You see, folks, if the Baptist church forgets our purpose in making disciples for Jesus Christ, we will also become obsolete. We will be irrelevant in this world. But we'll have lots of good springs and gears. 
just won't matter. Nobody will need them. We'll have perfect carpeted pews. It just won't matter. Nobody will sit on and walk on it. Everything will be pristine and we will have missed our purpose. We will go the way of the railroads and the Swiss. If we lose our focus and get distracted by tradition or by habit or by custom or by ritual or by routine, we miss out. You see, I want both the services of the Waldrop Memorial Baptist Church sole purpose to win people for Jesus. The sole purpose. Everything else works off that. You know, if 15 people walk down the aisle and got saved, wouldn't everything else work off that? Wouldn't your sense of class work off that? Wouldn't the brotherhood work off that? The WD work off that? Wouldn't the Sunday school work off that? Wouldn't the deacons work off that? Wouldn't the offerings work off that? Everything else works off that! We've got to get focused on that. The main thing has to be the main thing. So, I want us to be a spirit-controlled church that's going out into the streets with spiritual power and authority. You won't offer it to be like that? Then we cannot continue to do what we've been doing. What we've been doing has produced where we are. Or do we just want to be CNS Railroad? Obscure. Irrelevant. Or would we like to dominate the city for Jesus? Because people always go where Jesus they still do. I mean, they still do in this city. Their church is having to start other locations because their buildings won't hold them all in this city. So how does that come about? Well, it comes about, first of all, by us repenting. Judgment always begins in the house of God. Always begins in the house of God. So we first have to repent of our sins. God, what we've done hasn't produced what you want, maturing disciples. So we repent. We may have to do some things that we've done before that we just didn't like doing. That we just got tired of doing. But it's still the right thing to do. You know, there's a verse that says, Do not grow weary in well doing. Don't quit. Our job is to take the gospel to the streets. And so if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, I'd love to take it to you for the first time by saying a simple prayer. Father, forgive us, Jesus, save us. Holy Spirit, come and live within us. It's a simple prayer. The church, this is for us. Let's become relevant. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, we humbly submit ourselves. We, we have seen industries fall. We don't want the church to do that. So God, we pray that you would help us to be relevant and dominant. We pray that you would help us to make a difference in this city by seeing many women saved at Walmart. So we humble ourselves. We repent of our sins. We ask you to give us yet another chance. If, God, if we really do want to do the works of you, if we really want to put our faith and trust in you, if we want to believe you enough to do what you said, please give us the courage to believe you. And we make our prayer in Jesus' name. Would you stand with us, please? In number 434, I have decided to follow you, Jesus.